Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a reminder that True Crime Garage is both sugar-free and good for you. Here is the captain. It's all lies, I tell you. It's all lies. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still sipping on some delicious eternal autumn brewed by the great folks at Track 7 Brewing Company. This West Coast style IPA is a dandy. The Eternal series from Track 7 Brewing is back with Eternal Autumn. This tropical IPA features notes of pineapple, mango, and papaya with citrus undertones. Its malt character is rich with a slightly nutty undertone. Garage grade, five out of five bottle caps. Cheers to all of you, wherever you are listening to today's show, and cheers and thanks and praise to our Beer Run contributors, starting with Adam from Surfers Paradise, Queensland. And a big we like your jib to Jennifer Vaughn in Queens, New York. Next up, we have a big cheers to Lena from Alpharetta, Georgia. And last but certainly not least, we have Kania McLeod in Nampa, Idaho. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and pitched in on this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yep, 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 yep. B-W-E-W-R-U-N, beer run. Can you really call yourself a True Crime Garage fan if you're not listening to Off the Record? You need to go to Stitcher Premium and sign up. It's well worth the money. You'll thank me later. Over 170 episodes. Check it out, my peeps. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. When we left off yesterday, Captain, we were trying to decipher and narrow down the time of death for Tracy Harkness. That is always key in any timeline, and the timeline is always one of the most important parts of any investigation, especially a homicide investigation. Now, in this investigation, the detectives did a lot of digging to try to figure out whether Tracy had gone straight home from that party or if she had maybe stopped off somewhere, maybe a bar. As we mentioned yesterday, she was known to do this in the past and was a regular at several bars in the area, like the VIP and Rainey's. But remember in the past few weeks leading up to her death, she had rejoined her church and vowed to clean up her act and said no more bars, no more drinking, etc. Detectives were never, this is key to, to this timeline, Detectives tried very hard to find out if she stopped anywhere on her way home, and they were never, never able to find any bar that Tracy was seen at on the night in question, which is Thursday, November 5th, 1992. Well, and like we said, this is a typical Midwestern suburb, not a lot of bars. So it wasn't like law enforcement. This is one of the advantages law enforcement have in this case is to go and question people at these bars or to question the owners. They would have known all these people. And if she went out of the area to visit people that she knew, let's circle back on the idea that of something we pointed out yesterday, everybody in her social circles seemed to know each other. It was rather just one big social circle rather than these different social circles. They all kind of knew each other and they all, kind of like to talk about everybody else's business. So had she been spotted anywhere, I believe this would have been easy for detectives to discover in their investigation. Obviously, Tracy worked a normal day on that Thursday, November 5th, but did not show up on Friday the 6th to her job. Her supervisor tried calling Tracy's apartment several times during the day, but never received an answer. Neighbors confirmed for detectives that Tracy's car was not in its parking spot at 10 p.m. on Thursday the 5th, but it was there at 3 a.m. 
and then was spotted by another neighbor at 5.45 a.m. on the 6th. So the party ends at 10.30. She leaves the party roughly at 10.30. Detectives have every indication, no reason to think otherwise, that she likely drove home, straight home from the party, as she told several other people in attendance at that party that she was going home afterwards. Right. Now we have neighbors confirming a couple things and narrowing down the window of that time of death. Her car was not in her parking spot at 10 p.m. Makes sense. We have people at the party saying she didn't leave till 1030. Couldn't have been home any earlier than 1040 if she did leave at 1030. So this all this information is backing itself up here. It's the checks and balances. So the neighbors say no car at 10 p.m. on the 5th, but it was there at 3 a.m. on the 6th and again at 545 a.m. on the 6th. And remember, her body was found on the afternoon of the 6th. So really, we've already narrowed it down to roughly 1040 p.m. on the 5th to 3 a.m. on the 6th. And I don't think that anything happened in her car or along the way home because we have detectives who process Tracy's vehicle and no blood was detected. There were prints lifted and submitted for processing. It looks to me like they all came back to people that they would have expected to have been in the car at some point that were people known to Tracy. Now, detectives would go on to say that they believed Tracy Harkness was killed overnight on the 5th leading into the 6th. Let's compound that by the idea of Tracy's friends who said that she would always change her clothes upon arriving home to wind down for the night. So if her friends are correct, the attack would have went down very shortly after she arrived home that night on the 5th. If she left the party and went straight home, as she said, she would have been there right around 1040, 1045 p.m. Which, again, I think leads to this idea that the murderer knew her, possibly knew her schedule, and was possibly waiting there for her. Not necessarily inside the apartment, but could have been waiting. And and like I said, once you see movement, once you see lights turning on in that apartment, then that's when you make your attack. And they did a lot of digging in this case. So investigators subpoenaed Tracy's phone records. They checked her answering machine. You remember those things. They pressed redial on her phone at the apartment and spoke to the person that answered. They collected her address book and contacted listed parties in her address book. And they even read her diary. They also looked at the possibility that this may have, they didn't just rule out random attack right away or maybe targeted for other reasons than what they would remember. They land on the idea that this was a crime of passion, that somebody was angry with Tracy. They had some kind of confrontation and this was the result. They didn't rule that out right away. They did their due diligence here. They even looked at any potential repairmen or maintenance people that would have had affiliation with the Regency arms apartments. And they did note that in October, there was a repair or maintenance man in her apartment. That man, his name was Jim Brady. And so they checked in on him as well. And those, all of those items don't seem to go anywhere. They're kind of stuck in the mud, the detectives are, of this idea of, look, this was somebody that knew her. This was somebody on her inner social circle And that's where we're going to find the killer of Tracy Harkness. So eyebrows will be raised when it's learned that Tracy had a life insurance policy that was going to be paid out to her ex-husband, Mike. Yes, Captain. Mike Harkness was the beneficiary of a $82,000 life insurance policy on Tracy Harkness. Now, what's interesting here in this investigation is... Obviously, Mike is not going to try to sweep this under the rug or hide this fact from investigators. In fact, he admitted that Tracy actually called him. This is really bizarre. Called him the Wednesday before her death. So if she's attacked on a late Thursday night or early Friday morning in the in the small hours of Friday morning, 
we're talking about this conversation took place probably within 36 hours of her murder. And he says that, Hey, she called me on this Wednesday and asked who the beneficiary of his policy was. So he has a life and life insurance policy on himself. Right. And she has a life insurance policy, very responsible to do when you have a child. They have this conversation because she tells him, hey, I'm cons- you are the beneficiary of my life insurance policy. I'm calling to see who's the beneficiary of yours because I'm considering changing it, changing the person that is listed as the beneficiary. And so Mike tells the police, look, she got upset when I told Tracy that she's not the beneficiary of my life insurance policy. It's my mom. And she says, well, why would you pick your mother? And he says, I know, you know, no slight against Tracy, but he says, I know that my mom will use the money to take care of our daughter, Megan. So he's saying, look, this isn't a big deal to Tracy, but no, it's either pure coincidence or it's very weird that this conversation takes place where she's considering changing up the beneficiary within 36 hours or so of her murder. Yeah. This is one of those things in the case where you go, how bizarre, how bizarre, because that gives you motive right there. And the other thing that I don't, you look statistically, the husband did it or the ex-husband, right? Statistically, that's, that's what happens in these cases. The other thing that I don't like about Mike's story in general is that he went hunting on that Friday. I would like to know when was that trip planned? Well, that's, that's exactly right. That's interesting that you say that. So from, we have some details about that information. Well, give me the details. So detective Robinette and Sergeant Deskins went to Mike's residence on that Friday. This is November 6th. They're there at 6 PM. This is when they speak to his fiance, Sherry. Mike is not home. He's still away for the day hunting. And remember, we have Megan, the daughter, who is with Mike's mother being babysat that night. Detectives verified that Megan was with Mike's mother. They left a business card for Mike to contact them when he returned from hunting. So he actually returns a short time thereafter and calls the police as he, you know, as they instructed. He quickly sits down for an interview with them. This is on the night of the 6th. So we don't have a whole lot of time that expires. Her, her, she's found a r- roughly around 3 p.m. that afternoon. They go to his house around 6 p.m. He's not there, but he returns shortly afterwards. And still that same evening, he's sitting down with detectives and they are interviewing him. Now, he tells them that he and Tracy were close, had always been close. They stayed close. They talked daily, mostly about their daughter as they were juggling, taking care of her. He told police that on the fifth Thursday, he was in Alum Creek hunting for the day with his buddy, John Ford. Okay. So this, this hunting trip wasn't just on that Friday. It was on that Thursday as well. And this was just a daytime hunting trip for he and his friend. So let me get this correct. They go out on Thursday, they go hunting, they come back home on Friday, they go back out hunting. Yes. And remember this is early November and hunting seasons change throughout the year. There would have been a, there's a good amount. Typically I couldn't find the actual hunting seasons schedule for 1992, but usually in the November months and once November hits and it starts to get cold here in Ohio, there are a significant number of animals that you are allowed to hunt per the rules and regulations once that that time frame hits. So for people that don't live in in Ohio or don't live in areas where hunting is a more common hobby, it's not uncommon. I I can count I have to go to my second hand to count the number of people that I know that take a week off from work as soon as that sun, their their favorite hunting season opens up during that year. 
And I don't know when his first day off was or when his last day off was to be scheduled. But from the information that we have, Mike was on a week's vacation. And that that week's vacation was primarily based around the idea of hunting with his friends. So it sounds to me, I don't have, I can't put a definitive date on when all of this stuff was planned, but usually when you have to take off time from work, you're doing that well in advance of the days that you are seeking to uh, be away from work. Right. If I'm law enforcement, I want to know when he planned that. And when did the week start and when did it end? Because some people will book in their weekends. Oh, give me Wednesday off and then I'll come back the following Wednesday. Or or was he off Monday through Friday? I'd just like to know that if I'm law enforcement. The other thing I want to know is when he goes out with his buddy, Mr. Ford, how, how long is he with that individual? And if you're correct and they went out, Thursday and then they came back home and then went out again Friday that would still put him within the area of those apartments and of the murder scene. Yeah. So the area where he's hunting is roughly a 30 minute or 45 minute drive at best from Tracy's apartment. So we're not talking, we're not talking like he's States away. He's, he's with a, a relatively short drive, 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes at the most i would be guessing here well but help me get clear on this did he go out thursday night and then come back home yes Yes. so we and we have that information so what we have here is that on let's go to that thursday because that's when the time in question starts on the fifth on thursday he's at alum creek hunting for the day with his good friend john ford on that same day sherry picked megan up from daycare around 5 30 And then Mike is home at 7.30. He and Megan and Sherry were all home that night. Sherry backs this up. And then to further back that up, we have John Ford that verifies that, yes, we came home at 7.30 on Thursday. And then Mike and I left to go back out hunting again on Friday morning. And it is in the notes that he had that Mike was on a week vacation a a vacation the notes say that he was on vacation that week which makes me believe that it was monday through friday that that very week but i i don't know i wouldn't say that with 100 percent certainty it just looks like he took off a week from work but again what time do they leave on friday do we know that do they leave at 7 a.m do they leave at 5 a.m i don't have that in my notes the only reason why i'd like to know that is because we see no movement in our car we have this time period, like you said, did the attack happen pretty close when she came home? Possibly. And what, what evidence do we have of that? Oh, well, she liked to change her clothes. Was it possible that she came home and she turned on the TV and she sat down and she fell asleep and then somebody wakes her up at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. or 3 a.m.? You see what I'm saying? And then that person goes back home they take their shower, they clean up, and they they go hunting for the day. It's not out of the realm of possibility. It's not, but I think the problem with that theory is the statements by the others that are backing up, hey, I came home at 7.30 and then I left the next morning to go hunting. No, I agree and I disagree because if you go to <laughs> if you went to sleep with your significant other and that's all they know but you were planning to leave at 5 a.m. for a hunting trip, but you decided to wake up at 2.30 and go commit this crime and then come back, there's a good chance that your significant other wouldn't have any clue of what time you left the bed that night. That's all I'm saying. In the conversation with the detectives, Mike Harkness does tell them that he had met this other individual that we will get further into as we go, and that is David Seelock. Remember, David is the most recent boyfriend of Tracy, and the two broke up shortly before she was killed. Mike said that he met David once, and Tracy told him that David had a record for assault with a deadly weapon. Now, this is a little bit of hearsay, Captain. I couldn't find any actual charges against David Seelock for an arrest with a deadly, you know, for an assault with a deadly weapon. 
Right. I mean, unless it took place when he was a youth, I, I think that this might just be rumor. And I think as we see, as we go, it might be understandable why this was a rumor, or maybe this is something that David Seelock made up and would tell other people. Now he goes on to tell the detectives that Tracy told him that she had not slept with David, even though they had a, some kind of a relationship for a brief period of time and that she was back going to church at this time of her life. And Mike also told detectives that Tracy told him that she had to break up with David Seelock because David Seelock kept hanging out with his ex girlfriend, Janet. Now Mike said, Old Janet. Mike said after hunting all day, when he got home that night, Sherry told him about Tracy's death. And that's when he called the detectives later. Mike told police that he paid Tracy's burial expenses. Detectives notes indicate that they found no inconsistencies in Mike's story. Well, like I said, statistically, you're going to want to look at the boyfriend or the partner And I don't like it when it seems like that individual is establishing an alibi, but I don't think in this case, Mike is establishing an alibi. I think those were the events that happened that week. And to back that up, we have Mike's partner. And on top of that, we have this hunting friend that went with him two days in a row. So I don't, I feel like those events are truthful and he's not establishing an alibi. Now we need to introduce someone named Christina Dempsey, who went by the name Tina to most of her friends. She had known Tracy for six years. I believe they met while they were in high school. She was the bridesmaid at Tracy and Mike's wedding. She says that she last saw or tells police that she last saw Tracy about a week before the murder. And she saw her at church at the Grace Memorial Church. She says that she talked to Tracy multiple times a week. Again, police are still trying to gather up information on who their victim is, and that will likely lead them to who the perpetrator is, especially when you have this type of crime where you believe you're talking about a crime of passion with the likely perpetrator or perpetrators being somebody on the inner social circles of your victim. Tina says that Tracy was a typical redhead. She was opinionated, had a temper. Tina says their church was religiously conservative, but Tracy strayed a number of times from the church, saying that Tracy went to bars and partied on occasion. In the last month of Tracy's life, we have Tina who is confirming that Tracy made a promise at the altar to straighten out her life and to stop going out to bars and to stop drinking, and she's regularly attending church again. Tracy called her. That Thursday afternoon, the Thursday in question, this was to ask Tina again, if she would go to the lingerie party. So it sounds to me like Tina was invited to this party prior, but she already had plans with her boyfriend that evening. So she would not be attending that same party. Tina said, Tracy told her that she met David Seelock when he was on the rebound. She said he treated her really nice and they had a lot to talk about saying that Tracy liked him, but didn't, but didn't sleep with him. According to what Tracy told Tina, the information that Tina provides to police is that David had just broken up with his girlfriend, Janet, and they had two kids together. And after they broke up, he and Tracy start this relationship and he's crashing at Tracy's apartment. But it wasn't like this big romance as far as Tina was concerned. And eventually David Seelock goes back to, or attempts to go back to his girlfriend, Janet, this after Tracy and he broke up, whether how official or unofficial the relationship was, it was ended. Just seems like (laughs) a lot of wasted time and a lot of drama. Oh, this part is really interesting here, captain, because Tina, and this this will be become even more interesting once we get into some of these persons of interest. Because when you start going through these persons of interest and some of the relationships that, that Tracy had in her life and the people in her social circles, you can see the potential for enemies. Now, Tina tells police that 
she knew of no enemies, male or female, of Tracy's, but goes on to tell detectives that, look, Tracy and I lived somewhat different lifestyles, and because of that, Tracy would keep secrets from Tina because Tina was very religious and also openly admitted to detectives that she was rather judgmental of her friends. And so Tracy would keep secrets or maybe just not tell Tina every single thing that's going on in her life. Yeah. We all have friends like that. There's times that maybe I go to a party with friends or I go to a bar with friends and I, I had a little bit too much to drink. And there's some people that I will tell that story to. And there's other people that I keep that to myself. A lot more to uncover in this case. Let's get to some POIs after this quick beer break. If you're spending time with loved ones for the holidays, chances are you're going to hear a lot of stories, the ones you love to hear and the ones you've heard too many times. But have you ever wanted to help your loved ones document their stories? StoryWorth makes it fun and easy to basically write a book of life memories. Every week, StoryWorth will email your loved one a life-related question that you pick from their collection, like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? All they have to do is reply with a story. Then after a year, StoryWorth compiles everything into a beautiful hardcover book. The whole process is so simple. Get started with your loved one for the holidays, and before you know it, you'll both be cherishing those timeless stories for generations to come. I got StoryWorth for my father because he said to me one day, I want my grandkids to know who I am. And I thought, what a great way for him to just take a, take a little moment every week to answer the questions that StoryWorth sends him, and we're going to learn so much. Heck, these questions are probably going to make your loved one remember things that they've never even told you. Help your family share their story this holiday season with StoryWorth. Go to storyworth.com slash TCG today and save $10 off your first purchase. That's S-T-O-R-Y. W-O-R-T-H dot com slash TCG to save $10 off your first purchase. Check out storyworth.com slash TCG today. All right, we are back the windows to the walls cheers everybody and make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you're not subscribed already cheers to you cheers to you captain let's get into some persons of interest at least as far as the police were concerned in this case and from what was reported in the news at the time and since then rather this tidbit comes from the grove city news from November of 1992. And it's a quote from one of the officers. It says, quote, for now, at least the notion of a random killer has been ruled out. Police theorize the killer knew the victim. This is coming from Sergeant Deskins, who went on to explain, quote, at this point, we don't think we have a random stalker to deal with. We also feel that robbery wasn't the motive in this case. End quote. The fact that Tracy wasn't sexually assaulted either seemed to remove that as a motive as well. It pointed to someone being angry with her and killing her in a rage. Now, we got a list of people that we need to go through here, Captain. And let's start with the ex-husband, Michael Harkness. As we pointed out, it seems, on the surface at least, that he had an alibi for the time in question. He had returned from hunting with his buddy, John Ford, and hung out at home with Megan and his fiance Sherry, all night on the Thursday. It looks like this alibi, whether us or the listener or whomever wants to believe it or not, it appears based off of a lot of information that this alibi had enough backing it up that the police felt pretty firm about this alibi. 
because we have Sergeant Deskins on record saying, quote, if I had to go out on a limb and rule out anybody as a suspect, it would be him, end quote, talking about Michael Harkness. Well, look, I don't like when law enforcement does that. I think if you're law enforcement, you, you keep it close to the the vest. You you Anytime they bring up anybody, you say, we're not ruling anybody out. And yes, you have a alibi, but you know where I stand on that. If the person is in a relationship with you, whether that is your parents, uh, a, a sibling, or or in this case, a romantic partner, I don't, I, I don't buy those as alibis. Right, and I'm in, in agreement with you. My suspicions here, Captain, would be for someone like Sergeant Deskins to say that openly in the newspaper indicates to me that they have a lot backing up Michael Harkness's alibi, that they're not just taking the word of his fiance. Well, yeah, right. And what's not in our notes and, and what we're not privy to, or at least what I'm not privy to is was his vehicles parked outside and did, did neighbors of, of Mike see his vehicles there all night long? So his alibi might not just be established by a romantic partner. It could be established in another way. That we're just not. And the reason why I'm putting a lot of weight on this statement by Sergeant Deskins, again, he says, quote, if I had to go out on a limb and rule out anybody as a suspect, it would be him, meaning Michael Harkness. The reason why I put a lot of weight to that and give a lot of credit to, to that statement is he's saying, if I had to rule out anybody. And what we will see is there's other people in this story that they never officially rule out. They don't officially rule out anybody. We just have that statement by Sergeant Deskins that if he had to rule out anybody as a suspect, it would be Michael Harkness. So to me, I feel like there's probably a lot pointing that he didn't do it. Again, we don't know. We are reviewing the case as the detectives saw at the time based off of the evidence that they found and evidence that was presented to them. Now, let's continue on with our list of individuals. So remember another person, high percentage, we talk about you want to look at the ex-husband or the husband or the boyfriend or the ex-boyfriend, the high percentage of the likelihood of finding the perpetrator nearest to our victim, the other person you always have to consider is someone who finds the body. Well, that was Stephen Hutter. And Stephen Hutter, interestingly enough, did have a record for felonious assault. He was interviewed at length. He and Lori helped Tracy move into her place. Remember, he and Lori were together when her body was found. Based off of the information we have, Stephen Hutter and his girlfriend, Lori, helped Tracy move into her apartment. They actually stayed there for one night after helping her move in. But he has a verified alibi. He was with Lori and at work on the night of the murder per police. And then the thing about him, too, he is one of the few people on this list that you can look at and go, well, I don't see a motive here. Several of these other individuals, you can, you don't have to use your imagination too much to see a potential motive with, which is a perfect segue to our next individual named Mitchell Wiseman. This was a former boyfriend of Tracy's, but we got to go back a, a lot of years for this relationship. He was Tracy's high school boyfriend. They dated for about a year when they were 16. Now, Mitch has an extensive criminal record. A lot of the, his criminal record is after 1992, after Tracy was killed. I do want to clarify though, that most of his, the charges against him, it's pretty minor stuff. It's a lot of traffic violations, a lot of being negligent with, with his, his vehicle, with his license and some OMVI stuff. So I want to be clear that there's not a lot of violence in his criminal record. Right. Yeah. So he's, he's 
a ho- <laughs> he shouldn't own a car and he's bad at he shouldn't own a vehicle is the, it, it, it right but that doesn't make you a murderer correct correct his wife heather was interviewed at length as well now heather tells police that tracy our victim was actually stalking her husband mitch and says that she would catch Tracy sitting in her car outside of their house and calling the house and hanging up. If Heather answered the phone, this is interesting because this isn't the only person that we hear this type of behavior from. Remember we had other people that reported that if Tracy was really into somebody, she might show up at their place of work unexpectedly. Or if that man was already in a relationship, she might show up, at their home unexpected. That's very dangerous behavior because in this scenario, if it's true that, that Tracy was stalking this man, this married man, now you have two enemies. You have this married man that you are now causing conflicts for him. Happy wife, half happy life, not a happy wife. So that would give him motive to maybe confront her. And then maybe the confrontation gets out of hand because like we also heard that, that Tracy could be physical. So is there a possibility that this man tries to confront her to get her to stop whatever she's doing? And there, then a confrontation breaks out or the other enemy becomes the wife because, and, and again, it could be a, another situation where, the wife decides to confront the individual and, and it gets out of hand and, and murders the end result. Well, and it gets a little more messy when we really hone in and zoom in on this situation. So Heather knew Tracy from not just this situation, but, but she knew Tracy fairly well because they went to the same church and they ran in the same social circles when police are like, Hey, can you bring us up to speed on what's going on in Tracy's life at the time of the murder? Heather reports to police that she had heard that Tracy was dating a guy from it's, it's somewhat of a gang. I guess she would call it. It was, they, they call themselves the fifth street wrecking crew. She doesn't offer up any names of who this individual is within the fifth street wrecking crew. But she says that, and again, this could just be a rumor that she's reporting, but as she reports it to police, she says, Tracy was dating a guy from the fifth street wrecking crew. It was known to her or believed by Heather that Tracy was scared of this man, whoever he was. Yeah. Guy sounds like a canoe full of dicks. She goes on to tell police that the rumor around the bars and such, and in their social circles is that. That is the guy that killed Tracy. Now, what that rumor is based off of, who knows? But that's what she's reporting to police. Now, this is where this whole situation with Mitch or Mitchell Wiseman and Heather and Tracy gets very bizarre to me. This is I I find this to be bizarre behavior, but I want to I really want to give it to me. I really want to point this out. I really want to point this out. Yes. Give it to us. We're ready. We have Heather reporting this information to the police, right? At the time that she's reporting this information, this is after Tracy has been killed. So we don't have Tracy to answer and present her side of this story. We should be very clear on that. We're only getting one side of this story. So Mitchell is interviewed on the night. He admits to police that he and Tracy had a six month long affair when Mitch was married to his wife, Heather and Heather was pregnant. What a fart. This was between Tracy's two marriages to her ex-husband, Mike. We don't have an exact timeline on this, but if you use the information that we've already delivered, you can put a little bit of a timeline to this. We know that Tracy's marriage, second marriage to Mike was over even as far as the courts are concerned by April of 1992. Right. And according to this information, this six month long affair between Mitch and Tracy went down between the two marriages. 
And remember, we have Michael on record, Mike Harkness on record saying, look, we were really only actually together for about a month between August and September of 1991. So based off of all of that information, I'm going to say that this affair, whenever it took place, was probably over and done with before August of 1991. And I think it's important to point all of that out because if there is beef or anything going on in this situation between Tracy, Mitch, and Heather, well, all of the information we have, all indicators say that that relationship would have been over with 14, 15 months, roughly, before Tracy was killed. So right. it, it's a bit, while it's a big story, it may be a nothing story, but still let's get into these details because this is really bizarre behavior. So they have this six month long affair. This takes place when Mitch's wife is pregnant, right? right. How bizarre, how bizarre. Mitch ends up breaking it off with Tracy. Tracy gets angry, according to Heather, and then went and told Mitch's wife, Heather, all about this affair. Yeah, her hope is if I tell your wife, then that's going to cause a conflict. She's going to leave you, and then you're left with me. Right. And so this, of course, is going to cause all kinds of problems between Mitch and Heather. But obviously, we know they were able to work it out, work through it, because they are still together uh, in November of 1992. Because of this situation, Mitch says that he, you know, he had already broke it off with Tracy, but would distance himself from her. And in fact, very quickly lost touch with Tracy. But this was until they happened to run into each other at a New Year's Eve party. And they may have started seeing each other again, depending on who you ask. Well, let me just, let me just throw out this, this flag, by the way, because we don't have Tracy here to give us the deets, Correct. right? Correct. But when normally when there is an affair or something bad happens, people try to minimize that. So when he says, well, it was a six month month affair, it could have been longer, but it also shows the state of mind that if you're not above having a relationship with a married man, then you're probably not above having a relationship when you're in a relationship. If that makes any sense. Agreed. I don't want to get into a victim blaming or shaming situation here. I want to really underline the fact that we are talking about a whole bunch of people that are in their early twenties. And right. I'll tell you what, this will surprise no one. I was no angel myself in my early 20s. So we we all have a lot of growing up to do at that time. And many of us, I'm a firm believer in this, many of us are not very We're much not fully developed. Not very much adults point. at that time, even right. though our driver's license may say that we are. Well, and also she, you know, Tracy was in a tough situation again. And I feel like a broken record when I say this is a different time period the early 90s she has a child you know society had expectations of women that are and they still have expectations of women to this day that are just not fair or don't make any sense so you have this young single mother and she seemed to become somewhat desperate to fill that to fill that void. Yes. And again, I, I think one thing I want to point out is that the information we have is that when they had this affair, this was before the second marriage to Mike. And there's other indicators in the reports that the, the affair stopped that Tracy and he stopped or Tracy and Mitch stopped seeing each other before Megan was born. And we reported that she was roughly about 18 months old at the time of Tracy's murder. But here's the really weird thing, captain, even after this affair is over with likely over with for months and months and months, Tracy moved in. It, the reports say across the street it, it, and it's not actually across the street, but she 
moves into the same neighborhood as Heather and Mitch. Yeah, that's suspicious. She moves in the place that she moved into that's in the same neighborhood as Heather and Mitch is the Grove City apartment that Tracy was later killed in. If you look at this thing again, a lot of the times when it's reported, it says moved in across the street. It's not really across the street. It's not really the same street. This was a a large apartment complex. However, Tracy is within and and you most of the time too when you sign up and you and you apply to to these apartments not always do you get to pick your apartment you're just taking whatever is unoccupied at the time right you're applying to be in the apartment complex you're normally not applying for a certain a certain location and normally if they approve you they might give you a few options but What makes this all weird. So she's roughly a little more than a football field away from, from apartment to apartment, Tracy's apartment to Mitch and Heather's apartment. And the thing that makes it weird is that Heather tells police that Tracy knew exactly where they lived. So this didn't just happen. You know, Heather doesn't seem to believe that it just happened. Well, and the thing here is it doesn't, we can't, just believe Mitch because he says the relationship's over because he is a liar and cheat to his wife. So why are we going to believe him? And we have no proof that Mitch didn't say, Hey, why don't you come move in close by me? The other weird thing here though, again, this is, again, this is according to Heather. We don't have Tracy here to confirm or deny this. She's saying that she believed that Tracy would follow them around and sit in her car and watch them. Now, Heather is so upset about Tracy living in such close proximity to them. She says that they tried to get out of their lease so that they could move, but the apartment complex, the only thing that they could offer them was, well, you could switch apartments, but you need to stay with us because you signed this lease. There's so many things about this. Cause like I said, it gives motive to both of them. It gives motive to Mitch to get Tracy out of his life. It gives motive to the wife to try to get Tracy out of their life. We can't move. Well, heck I'm just going to have to kill her. So we don't have to deal with this anymore. And then also you can't trust their alibi because they could have been in you know, this could have been a plan they made and tell me if I'm crazy for having this thought, but if I'm law enforcement, you know, you want to know what test I'm running. I want to make sure that that Mike is the biological father. So let's get into a potential alibi for these two individuals, right? Because you can see a lot of reasons why they would find themselves on a short list of persons of interest in this case. Mitch tells police, and this is later confirmed by police that on that Thursday night, his brother-in-law and sister came over to their apartment, this to help him install a ceiling fan. They left. And then at some point he and Heather go to bed. They say that they're in bed around 11. The other thing we need to point out, there's nothing wrong with your theory there or, or, maybe not your actual theory, but a potential theory in this case. The only thing about that though, is I would really kind of circle in on the idea that yes, this could have been planned, but there's a lot of indicators that this may not have been a planned attack that, that somehow things went bad. There's a confrontation, but it leads to this attack. Well, right. And that's what I'm saying is what if, Mitch and his wife go over just to have a confrontation. Maybe they, they saw her uh, in the neighborhood and went, Oh, she's following us again. We got, we got to go say something. My other issue with them is we don't have eyewitnesses. And you think that again, if somebody drove to the apartment and parked in the apartment space, that maybe you'd be more likely to have an eyewitness. If, the individual parked even down the street, maybe would be more likely to have an eyewitness. We have no eyewitness, but they could have just walked right a football field. That's the difference between these two persons of interest and 
everybody else on this short list is that these two, one or both of them were the only ones that had the, the ability to just simply walk to where the murder took place. Well, Mitch and Heather, again, there's so many red flags that are just going off, but sometimes in these cases, those are nothing burgers. Let's get into a suspect that might be even more interesting and throwing up more red flags. Yes. And this is an individual that we've mentioned several times. And this is straight from the reports here, Captain. And it looks like police learned very quickly from Tracy's family that remember she had recently broken up with a guy who some have said should be the prime suspect in this murder case. And I'm sure those who say that arrived at that conclusion for a multitude of reasons. This is David Seelock, age 22. He's listed as a dock worker and former landscaper and a member of the Fifth Street Wrecking Crew. And from what I gather, his hobbies were hunting and fishing, playing pool, playing video games, drinking, not working, and being an asshole. Well, that's an impressive list of hobbies. Grove City PD Sergeant Dennis Deskins said, quote, they didn't know if or where David went to school and his employment history is sketchy. Now, the detectives attended Tracy's well-attended funeral to see who would show up. Tracy's most recently rumored to be boyfriend or ex of approximately two weeks, David Seelock, did not show up. Join us back here in the garage. We like to let the cases dictate how many episodes we need to cover them. And this one's going to need more. So you're in luck. You get more True Crime Garage this week for your earballs. And until part three, be good, be kind, and don't litter.